I'm Tim Ventura, and we're joined by Steve Firth to discuss his paper, An Assay on the Axioms of First Contact. Steve has a bachelor's and master's in philosophy from the University of Lethbridge in Alberta, Canada, and for the last six years has been a PhD candidate in philosophy to the University of Helsinki. Steve's work includes research into practical applications of the picture theory of disability, experience teaching philosophy, logic, and research methodologies at the Southern Alberta Institute of Technology as part of the core education program, and volunteer work as an awareness advocate for cancer screening and early detection. So Steve, welcome. I want to get right into this paper. At the beginning of this you have stated that better data processing and sensors increase the likelihood of SETI-style discovery of extraterrestrial life. So I want to start out by asking, is it fair to say that this paper, again, we're talking about axioms of first contact, is really focused on exploring the need for a framework on how to approach first contact? Uh, yes, I think that's really the the entire thrust of the paper um the you alluded just now to uh increases in technology and and uh uh that's that's very true but in addition to that we have some machine learning tools and ai sort of number crunching which is helping process greater amounts of data like not quite exponentially more data but but more data and the increase in that data um, and the ability to process that data is making, um, and the discovery of, you know, exoplanets of, for the discovery of exoplanets and all these kinds of things. These are all adding up to, to, to creating, um, far greater potential of discovering extraterrestrial life. Um, and, and that makes, uh, sort of begs the question, what are we doing in our society to prepare for, you know, potentially uh, potential contact with extraterrestrial intelligence. I mean, there are two types of, of extraterrestrial life. There's just just life, organic life, maybe tree-like things or, you know, biological sort of entities like that. But the things that, that I'm more interested in and I think that we need to prepare more for is is the the discovery of extraterrestrial intelligence, which is a, a different order of extraterrestrial life that i think we've sort of hitherto we've kind of ignored it you know we've we've there has been some research done on on on, on you know how likely are we to find it and there's these probabilistic equations that we'll probably talk about shortly um that discuss you know why we haven't seen it and why we haven't discovered it and all of this kind of stuff um but there's been very little work done on on <laughs> what happens if we do discover it or what happens if it appears here there's very little work done on that at all. Um, and that's a, a fairly significant issue because as we've, as we've identified from COVID, we tend not to um, process major world events very well when they, when they occur. And, you know, if I could jump into that, that is why I am so excited about your work, because I think when it comes to, I mean, you could look at the UAP UFO phenomena, which is making headlines daily now, or you could look at SETI's exploration of the universe. Our, our knowledge and capabilities are expanding rapidly, right? I, I just saw a study the other day on um, the possible detection of organic compounds in exoplanet atmospheres. And so, yeah. you know, the, the human race is learning so much more about the universe and about our own world as well. And yet when it comes to things like this, it, it, you know, detecting alien life uh, and first contact, it's been like, we'll solve it when we get there. And right. what, really what your paper is saying is we're there. We should solve this now rather than wait until you know that moment has passed and something might have gone seriously wrong absolutely i mean the the, the point of this paper is while the, the paper has multiple points the, the first aspect of it is that the current disposition towards first contact to, to which you allude is one that it's very unlikely to happen um and if it does happen it'll happen in a in, in sort of um predictable ways um that are sort of anticipatory uh and uh and it it may or may not be a big deal and i i don't know that i share that 
um, sort of disposition. I don't. I don't think there's any probabilistic reason to believe that the the sort of suggestions of remote contact are any more likely than than Etty appearing in our orbit because we've met some threshold of interest. That there's that yeah. there's that there's a there's a agenda is the wrong word, but there's a sort of a closed mindedness to current research which sort of prohibits considering imminent discovery of of Etty in in our solar system. But as the recent discovery or the recent pass through of the the big rock Oumuamua, um, which which I think was 2018, I think uh, that it came through the the solar system. Maybe a little more recently, I forget the date. Um, but it's there's no reason to suppose that these kinds of or were that some sort of Etty probe. There's no reason to assume that that couldn't be a a probe that would um, you know send information back on its tour through the through the galaxy. And I think. The, the fact that we've not prepared for any of that kind of sort of discussion properly. I mean, we've sort of philosophically banded some ideas about it and, and SETI have some things to say about it and METI have lots to say about it. Um, but there's no real, there's no real uh, cohesion of opinion. There's no, uh, no agreement on the terms that are going to be used. There's no, worldwide government approach there's no agreement for a worldwide government approach i mean one of the difficulties of course of 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 contact first contact with extraterrestrial intelligence were it to ob obtain here is that there's not one voice from the from the planet there's a whole bunch of disparate voices um which will harbor their own agendas as you've probably seen in the movie arrival um to greater or, le or greater or worse sort of result and 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 this is a like this is a problem this is exactly what we witnessed in covid and and if it actually does obtain it's not going to go well actually you're bringing up a good point when you talk about medi so that's messaging to extraterrestrial intelligence right and it, as right. i understand things um you know this is basically sending out signals right we're sending out a hello signal more or less and, you know, this is something that I believe the Voyager probe has a plaque on it. So this idea goes back quite a long ways. It is uh, basically announcing our presence, right? But it, it does bring up the question of having a framework for how our species as a whole communicates with other species. And right now, that's something that's kind of been left up to various scientific groups, right? Like, in the case of Voyager, I believe they probably had a panel that put that together that was largely scientific. In the case of Medi, you have different groups that are trying to come up with messaging. But, you know, again, when you're talking about species-wide communication, right, um, it, it does bring up this question of, uh, like, can they represent the human race? And if not, then who should? What is the framework for that? And that's really what you're addressing in terms of the axioms. Yes, we have a situation currently where uh, the messaging of extraterrestrial intelligence is generally understood in the scientific community to be bad. There are a number of philosophers that have gone on record arguing that it's bad and, a num and many scientists um, because they are under the impression that attracting uh, the attention of an extraterrestrial intelligence would be a bad thing. And this is couched and the understanding that that uh, extraterrestrial intelligence are necessarily um, aggressive or harmful, uh, and that is the only justification they have for arguing that it it would be uh, a bad move. I think that those dispositions are a little rash, and I I think they're probably born of this kind of human tendency towards violence, which I, I'm not going to get on this. Uh, anthropological bandwagon but there's a th there is a tendency of humans to act aggressively uh, especially to that which they don't really know and and it sort of results in this thing called a hobbesian trap which is is discussed in my paper and and so the 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 hesitancy to um transmit messages even were that able to be received or communicated um properly uh, it has resulted in very little um, positive uptake. And I think there's a whole bunch of background here that, that's wrong behind that. But uh, in an effort to kind of direct the 
agenda a bit more cohesively, I have this, I've, I've thought or, or tried to create um, what I call axioms, what are axioms, which are um, propositions that don't depend upon any subordinate proposition for their truth value or their dependability. Now, they are assumptions, um, and assumptions generally are, are, you know, sort of straight away against because they, they have the potential to be uh, wrong or false or bad or misplaced. Um, but the difference with axioms is that they are assumptions that are, are quite ground level, they're quite base level, and they form a groundwork from which you can build stably. We use yeah. ground we use axioms in logic and mathematics because they are pivotal in the way that we create the framework and structure um, of all of the thought that develops above that. And so uh, instead of um, this dominant kind of game theoretical thinking, which is very anthropocentric, you know, this very human idea we have of, of this is a risk, therefore we should do this, or this is a risk, therefore we should do that, um, or uh, sort of double guessing what's going to go on. So if aliens were aggressive, then we should do this thing. But all of these assumptions about whether or not aliens are aggressive, these are not axiomatic. These are um, these are f far more subordinate kind of uh, ideas, assumptions that are not safe to make. Uh, well, they have no basis in truth. They have no basis in fact. They have no basis in evidence. There's there's no justification for believing that's the case, apart from their usefulness in eliminating potential risks. And we all have heard of the these silly thought experiments where people say, you know, well, uh, crossing the road is a risk, and 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 perhaps we shouldn't go outside of our house because you're more likely to be hit by a meteorite outside of your house than inside your house, and these things are all true. Um, but they don't sort of direct the way we act in the world reasonably because those are trivial sort of um, uh, uh, risks, whereas this is generally considered to be an extreme risk that has planetary consequences. And I agree that it has planetary consequences, and I agree that it's a risk, but I don't agree that it's a risk in the in the major way that it's been heralded as one, if that makes sense. And I and I and I certainly don't believe that it should dictate the way we plan towards any interactions, because I think that would be I think that's bad thinking. I think that's philosophically poor. Now, I want to talk about the Hobbesian trap briefly, which is also called Schelling's Dilemma. You mentioned this a moment ago. This is an idea from game theory, which basically describes mutual military escalation and first strike potential that's basically couched in fear, uncertainty, and doubt. Uh, the U.S.-Soviet Cold War is the best example of this, right? That's what we're all probably familiar with, I guess, from history. Absolutely, yeah. The... The game theory is a very powerful tool um, which seeks to provide mathematical sort of guidance and probability or estimation of certain kinds of actions in, in interactions between parties and groups or individuals. And there are they can be mathematically presented in what, what are called matrices, uh, and you can uh, institute a number uh, that... that uh, that that stands for a kind of risk value or a payout value um, of a certain kind of action, and it's a very powerful tool. And of course, the 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 there's been a couple of movies about it. One, of course, with uh, Russell Crowe, um, and very powerful tools. The downside is that they are geared towards describing human human interactions or human group human group interactions. And one of the one of the arguments that I make is that the Hobbesian trap, as it's as it's sort of presented mathematically, um, requires a certain kind of equivalence. And this goes back to where it gets its name from. The philosopher Thomas Hobbes um, identified, as you mentioned, this this sort of sensitivity we have or fear of uh, he called it diffidence, but this fear of or uncertainty of another person or another state or group's actions towards us or disposition towards us. And and with that fear and uncertainty, we sort of act defensively to the extent that we seek 
we think rationally, we seek to uh, engage in some preventative action. What we see is what one individual sees as a preventative action, but which the other side sees as sort of um, preemptive strikes. So uh, often, I, I with with my when I teach, I have this uh, <laughs> sort of. Uh, notion that one individual is protecting their partner from some other uh, chap uh, or person who wants to steal access to their, um, you know, their life partner for, for whatever reasons. Uh, and this is a perfect example. In order to, we anticipate that rivals sort of intentions to our access, sexual access to this other individual. And so we seek to protect that. And in seeking to protect that, we seek to defend it. And because we're never quite sure when or how this other individual is gonna try and usurp us, what we do is we attack the other individual to prevent that from happening. And writ large, this is what happens in military escapades the world over, broadly speaking. It was uh, demonstrative in the Cold War, but also in <laughs> almost all of the other wars that have gone on because it's it's this kind of thinking. Now, one of the interesting things about game theoretical rationality is it provides this mathematical justification for these kinds of actions, but the results of these reactions are tend to be less good than the cooperative behavior and when run repetitively and over time and and recursively these uh, game theoretical sort of uh, analyses are dem demonstrated to be problematic to the yeah. extent that they they seem to end up we we seem to end up in a place that we don't want to be you know when we look back at well how did we end up here well we ended up here because we did this this and this and and now we're here and here's not a good place um this was the situation in the cold war and also in the cuban missile crisis um where we ended up in a very bad place and of course everybody's like how did we end up here and, and the answer is because uh we sought to usurp and preempt the strikes of the other and then we created this defensive position and and that sort of escalated tensions and be it became a gong show um and that's writ large in a societal sort of concept but it also have, happens one to one the difficulty with the Hobbesian trap and the prisoner's dilemma and all of these other sorts of, of uh, game theoretical sort of matrix uh, matrices is how to move from the game theoretically rational decision, the rational action to take, uh, which has a reasonable payout, but not the best payout, not the best dividend, not the best result. Um, to the actual cooperative one that that does have the best result in almost all of the the uh, game theoretical matrices the cooperative dividend is far greater than the than the uh, um than the, the the defective position uh the the, the position for defection uh which is the, the the one in which we privilege our own sort of self-interest um and so it's moving from our own sort of self-interest to this group uh, cooperative sort of dividend and it's how to do that and that's challenging because following game theoretical rationality it's always rational to, to act in one's self-interest but overall and always or almost always it's best to, to to do this cooperative thing and this is the point of the axioms if we can't depend upon if we can't depend upon game theoretical rationality to provide us a mechanism of deciding how to act that gets us to the good place. We can certainly use game theoretical rationality to get us to a place, and a place which has perhaps less risk. But that's not the best dividend. And of course, the best dividend is the best way forward. So Hobbes had this thing uh, where he argued that uh, there was a certain kind of equivalence between people. So the the person that's trying to protect their um, sexual partner from some other interest from some other person. Um, the argument goes that those two individuals that are sparring are broadly equal and they're either equal in strength or they're equal in, uh, you know, uh, mental agility or they're, uh, you know, one, one chap has the ability, uh, one person has the ability to create a, you know, a, 
a, a machine to defend a position or build a, yeah. a castle or whatever. And the other one just is stronger, you know, whatever, whatever kind of physical strength or attributes you have. And, and Hobbes says broadly on, on average, these two are equivalent. However, and that is the broad understanding, the implicit understanding of game theory is that these factions need to be in order for game theory to work, the factions need to be broadly equal. And I call it the, the Hobbesian equivalence principle. And if they're not equal, then all bets are off. Because if you have, as we saw recently, well, re not recently, but as we saw with the the uh, the felling, felling of the Twin Towers in America, um, uh, the very small group of unhinged people uh, took down um, pillars of, you know, capitalist might in in north america and and against this mighty machine of of the usa but still succeeded but the end result was that you know the the the, the war that resulted in uh, hundreds of thousands of miserable lives and well, because and steve i mean if, if i could jump in this takes me to the movie war games with matthew broderick at the yeah. end of the movie um they they teach the computer and i think that this has relevance to artificial intelligence as well right but what you're describing is in terms of this mutual escalation whether or not there's parity there um you know the only way to win is not to play yes yes or, or not to end up in that situation you're right because and this is my position in the paper is that this equivalence principle between us and Etty does not apply. And so game theory doesn't apply. And as you've mentioned, this parity aspect is very relevant because it, uh, when all said and done, might is, I mean, there are, there are examples of you know, a lot of people might quote David and Goliath, or there are other sorts of examples of smaller individuals taking down, you know, bigger battles or whatever. It's not just a matter of numbers. Um, of course, uh, strategy and, and all of the other things, equipment and supply lines and everything else that goes into it. Um, but broadly speaking, it's a matter of equivalence. You know, you are only able to reasonably defend your actions in this type of en endeavor if you're broadly equal. Uh, and the best way forward is, 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 and this is the point that I'm trying to raise about game theory, the, the the best dividend is not to end up in that situation or if you end up in that situation move towards mutual cooperation instead of mutual defection so instead of moving to war move to cooperation and that is the position that is not readily taken by uh, search for extraterrestrial intelligence certain aspects of nasa uh, uh meta are a bit more open-minded um but there's a lot of sort of negative philosophical work arguing that we shouldn't be getting anywhere near this discussion um because it might end up terrible well what'll end up terrible is if we don't have a plan at all <laughs> that'll be the, the the worst situation i think well yeah and again i i think that that's that's why I'm so excited about this, because one of the things that you've done in this paper, and this is very lengthy, very detailed, very well thought out. You have gone through this and analyzed it definitely from a philosophical nature, as well as from a practical and pragmatic nature. And I think one of the big things, and, and that comes through in an interview today, that you're taking into account is the fact that um, extraterrestrial intelligence and or artificial intelligence, right? Because the singularity is something that folks have talked about here on earth, or I, I think there are definite parallels there. When we have non-human intelligences, they are not going to respond the same way that we do, especially in terms of these tribal impulses that we have, right? Like you were talking about mate protection and things like that. Those come out of our evolutionary history right. and you know, maybe we'll outgrow those in time or, uh, you know, maybe we will learn how to redirect those effectively, but other intelligences don't necessarily have those. And so a lot of these things from game theory, these implicit assumptions may not apply, but if we approach it from that perspective, especially, you know, in terms of military strategy, 
uh, we may get ourselves into a bind anticipating actions, right? And again, this goes back to what you were saying about mutual escalation. Um, we are worried that they may escalate, so we escalate first. The problem is they may not think about it in those terms at all. That's exactly the case, yeah. Um, there's been recent uptake in, in the material uh, over the past sort of um, few years uh, into what's called post-biological life. So historically, uh, and in virtue of limits in our own technological sort of position, um, this uh, post-biological life has, has, has been thought to be the field of science fiction or, or you know, whatever. Um, and I, th I think that's unreasonable. And I think the post-biological sort of aspect of, uh, of life in the solar system or in the galaxy, well, in the galaxy, um, it's my clock ringing. Um, <laughs> it had to be the biggest hour, didn't it? Um, so the, the problem with the current disposition towards thinking about Etty is that we've always thought and we've always gauged uh, the capacities of extraterrestrial intelligence upon our own sort of anthropocentric ideas. And I think that's, I mean, we, we make efforts. I mean, these people at NASA and SETI are smart. They're not, they're scientists. They're not dumb. Um, but they're not always guided by the best philosophical thinking. Yeah. And so they make some mistakes whereby they say, well, you know, um, uh, uh, the one of the nearest habitable systems is 22 light years uh, away. Um, sorry, 22, um, 2200 light years away. So it would take several thousand light, several thousand years for something to get from there to us. So we, we should not worry about, you know, that occurring because that would be beyond the lifespan of a, uh, an entity perhaps uh, but that's a claim you can't make because post-biological life of course does not have those constraints well and, and, and this this actually i'm i'm really excited that you brought that up because I, I think that this is a sea change in the thinking and this is something that nasa is probably actually a little bit ahead of the curve on but it's very very new this idea that uh, life in the universe may not be biological in nature, right? It may have right. evolved past that or right. potentially been created by some earlier biological species. Um, this idea has really only been popular for, you know, maybe about 15, 20 years, and it's kind of gaining traction. Again, this goes to AI where, um, I, you know, I, I started reading about this, uh, you know, in a, a scientific sense, probably with Ray Kurzweil, I think he was probably the first one who really started to popularize this, you know, it was in science fiction before that. But even then, it was kind of like, okay, maybe we'll see this, you know, but it's it's hard to envision. But I think things like chat GPT are starting to bring this to the fore, where we can say, okay, well, wait a minute, here is something that it may not be sentient, but it can communicate very much like a human being. How long will it be before we start to see this in a real sense? And as this becomes more real to us, then we can start to see this in the universe, right? That um, alien life probably will be very much older than us. I would imagine uh, these, you know, these these uh, sentient machines could live for, uh, you know, millennia, right? So very different than we've anticipated in UFO movies from the 1950s. Um, yes, I, I I agree with you, and I and I you you're, you're right that this is a major game player change, um, and the, the, there are multiple reasons for that. Uh, let me just for a moment hit up the Drake equation as an example. So the Drake equation, which was created somewhat in the sixties, really not as any sort of it does provide a probabilistic quantification of potential life in the galaxy but that's that wasn't its point its purpose was to generate mechanisms of thinking about the potential life in in the, the galaxy not not you know as a, a tool actually to to enumerate them but let's just take it for example it has a number of aspects a number of sort of um 
uh, variables which you can fill with uh, numbers that you've got from more recent data. But one of the things it, it questions is, uh, it's, well, what are the number of the habitable worlds in solar systems in, you know, in, in the galaxy? But, and that seems like a reasonable sort of question, you know, if you're, if you're searching for Eti, what kind of worlds would be habitable um, for Eti to live on? And there's a bunch of scientific thinking gone into that, but it's a bunch of very old scientific thinking that hasn't sort of been modified. So the habitability of a world was at the time dependent upon this kind of squishy um, carbon-like object that has a particular temperate sort of um, uh, threshold and an ability to, and a requirement for, for liquid water and all of these sorts of things. Um, and, and so this habitable zone of warmth and rocky planet kind of sort of requirement became what it was to be in a habitable zone. But we realize now that that's not actually the case and that, uh, you know, there might be all sorts of life that, that, that doesn't require that level of habitability, it requires some level of habitability, but not this squishy carbon life uh, sort of requirement. It, it, it might be able to, you know, yeah. be without water, it might be able to, to, to be, some sort of silicon i mean that that's sort of so been it, dismissed a bit now but you know what this, i'm saying yeah uh actually what you're describing i believe kevin newth had had just revisited the drake equation and he described what you're talking about as outposts that might be one way to think of it where um you know perhaps life evolves you know as you mentioned twenty two thousand light years away but over time, it is able to migrate, especially if it becomes, you know, post-biological, right? Uh, you have machines like von Neumann probes or yep. something like that that could spread out. And so even though, you know, our potential home world may be 22,000 light years away, we may have outposts of that. We have main machines, Absolutely. probes, robots of some kind that are potentially right next door exploring Alpha Centauri. And there's Centauri. no reason to think that Etty can't be nomadic. We, I'm currently reading something. I don't even know where it is, but I'm currently reading something by Chozik about uh, the the um, space bioethics, uh, and in it he's discussing the potential of uh, genetically modifying humans for long term life in in space because of the the hardships of of human of, of space and and the the lack of hardship of the human body. So genetically modifying us to be a bit more resilient. But one of the, the thoughts behind this is because, and I'm going to underline this because I don't think people think about it sufficiently enough because in today's society, we tend only to think of five years hence. The capacity for Earth to harbor human life has a finite line. Like yeah. it's 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 limited and it's not limited in virtue of the fact that we're overpopulating, although that's a problem. It's it's limited in the fact that there are astrological um uh, um phenomenon. Um not astrological, there are astro astronomical um phenomenon uh, that that tend to wipe life out on planets uh we've had them already several times that yeah have wiped the, out the, the asteroid that and... wiped out right, the dinosaurs right, right. And, yeah. and there are other things gamma ray bursts there are solar flares that are significant there are you know long-term shifts of of planetary alignment and another there, there's a lot of stuff that goes on on a planetary scale that means that we have a limit and there's nothing we can do about that. We are not sufficiently capable of steering Earth or shooting down asteroids or any of these kinds of things, regardless of what you see in the movies. Um, and this is a problem. So in terms of long-term survival, and I don't mind, I don't mean like 100 years or I'm, like I'm talking ge geological sort of scales, we have to get off this planet if humans are to survive. So one of the thinking... Uh, one of the thoughts that's going on behind uh, Shuzik's book is that, you know, let's assume that humans are aware of this and become more more proactive in in sort of perpetuating the species by seeding, for want of a better description, the galaxy um, long term. Well, there are some bioethical considerations here, but there's an absolute need. 
And if we recognize that need, and at least some of us do, if we recognize that, and it, and it might be 10,000 or 20,000 or 100,000 years hence, but because we recognize that need, it is very likely that some other Etty have well, recognized that also and have had the need to do so. So their home world, as you quite mentioned, may no longer be their home world. Yeah, and it, actually, if I could add to that, um, there are some, again, emerging ideas in terms of, I'm thinking of the end of scarcity, right, or a post-scarcity society. And, you know, these are things that we're seeing come out of, like, nanotechnology and, again, it, you know, artificial intelligence and this idea that um, the material needs and wants that we would assume ET has in the past, right? Again, like UFOs are here for our, they're here for our women, they're here for our beer, yeah, they're right. here for, you know, they want to mine the oceans for this or that, or they want a home, right? W which is kind of the, what the, the backup plan to humanity goes to. Maybe they're here to steal our planet because theirs got destroyed. Any sufficiently advanced civilization would be able to create these things anywhere. They wouldn't need ours. And again, this goes back to the Hobbesian trap and and this perhaps irrational or semi-irrational fear of maybe they're here for this. But when we look at it from an advanced perspective, there would be no need. They could create that anywhere, right? I uh, Yes. And one of the... One of the the uh, absolutely terraforming. We just this week we created oxygen on Mars, right? So there's there is already steps by uh, NASA and other space organizations to recognize the needs of survival and habit habit building on these other worlds, uh, and we're in a nascent stage. I mean, we're 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 actually not a technologically advanced species. We think we are, but we're not uh, comparatively. We've had this kind of technology for maybe twenty years, and in that stage, we've we've done um, marvels really with the technology you spoke about AI. Uh, these tools have been developed over the last four or five years only, and we've remarkable development in such a short time. Now imagine that you happen to be a long-lived Eti species, the kind of species that has been successful in navigating the solar their solar systems and others for i don't know 10 or 15,000 years and, and we've managed to do what we've managed to do in five yeah uh, th these guys are going to be far ad far in advance of, of our technologies in, in ways that we can't even begin to speculate and this goes to one of the other um points that i bring up in the paper which is recognizability so we, I say we, the, the the planet and our experts in uh, this sort of field are really struggling to embrace the potential of the future because we're limited by the little bit of a the little bit of imagination that we have and based upon the technological advancement that we have to imagine what might be tomorrow. And I'll give you a good example of this. When we send children away to school, our job as, as teachers and, and parents is to provide those children with the tools that they need to achieve success when they graduate and go off into the world and become awesome humans. The problem is when we start this at maybe, I don't know, 12 years old, um, we we have no comprehension of what their life will be like 10 years hence because it was only 14 years ago that we created the iPhone and yeah. or maybe a little longer but you'll see that that level of thinking i i could not have in 2006 have imagined the kind of technological connectivity that we have no matter how good or uh, uh, accurate my anticipations were so this type of limit guides our thinking about the potentiality of what what kinds of things Etty might be in 10,000 years. And we the reality is that we can't have any kind of reasonable sort of guess. Um, what we can say is that we can start making these axioms, <laughs> these axioms that I've started to make in the paper, which have made very fundamental claims, which I've sort of encouraged other thinkers to 
augment and contribute and, and, and debate because the more of these actions we have, they're like building blocks. You know, you build this block and then this layer and then you add some more and then you add some more and then you add some more and then eventually you've got clear, uh, dependable thinking uh, that allows you to make claims, reasonable claims about what, what Ethi might be like in a way that we struggle to do now and in in ways that the current thinkers are sort of limiting the potentials I, we mentioned earlier that up until only recently everything that we talked about was like a biological life form and now we recognize that that's probably not going to be the case um you know and day. if i could jump in the the iphone thing reminded me of something and we have just for the audience you and i are, are working on an interview about uh, next week, we're going to be doing one about uh, extra extraterrestrial biological entities. But right, right. Um, I, I did want to touch on the iPhone thing. So my first cell phone was in the 1990s. I was probably right. a little bit late in the game compared to a lot of folks. I remember talking to my mother on the phone and at the time thinking, this is so incredible. Here I am right. driving and moving, and yet I'm having a conversation with someone who is stationary there, right? And so right. that was... You know, I mean, that's that's, you know, I, I don't know, maybe 30 years ago or something. Right. Yeah. Uh, the the iPhone was transformative. It transformed what a phone was. It, it right. went from being a communications device to being this global access to information and knowledge. Right. Where you could communicate in a variety of different ways, but you also have access to the world's knowledge. And then another transformative a device i believe is the apple watch which yeah. is transforming the way that we approach health right where this thing can monitor all of these bodily functions and and so when you mentioned the iphone the thing that got me excited about that was yes it is one example of rapid transformation to the point where people can't keep up with it within our lifetimes um it also shows us that we can't make a lot of assumptions about the capabilities of ETI. For instance, uh, alien autopsy in 1995. You know, one of the things that they they didn't take into account if they really did that autopsy in 1947, they wouldn't have thought that there would be advanced biometrics monitoring what was going on. It's kind of a scary thought, right? right? So here they are in their secret lab saying we can do what we want with impunity because we're right. buried under, you know, mountain of rock and all that. Well, guess what? Somebody is probably monitoring the whole thing a galaxy away. Well, I mean, this is I, I going back to the iPhone thing. I had a very similar experience. I've always been a futurist and I had a very early iPhone. And when FaceTime became a uh more functioning sort of thing i was sat on a beach in tenerife which is a small island off the off the coast of morocco and i received a call from a colleague of mine who was having a barbecue oddly enough um in in canada and we facetimed now to perhaps many of our listeners that's probably not earth shattering but at the time that was Star Trek level stuff. Yeah, right? yeah, video calls, right? And and video in the in the eighties and nineties, yeah. popular science would run these articles, and they would say, you know, when will the age of the video right. call star? Now it's it's ubiquitous. I mean, yeah. not only does FaceTime do it, there are probably ten or fifteen different apps that have some type of it. And there's a lot of technological. I mean, we we've developed with it, so we we forget the science that goes behind it. So there's the the difference in mileage between uh my colleague who was in Alberta and Tenerife is is probably about 14 uh to 20,000 miles I, i'm not sure i've never measured it but i'm guessing about that and there's a delay like no no matter how no matter how you crunch it there's there's a physical time delay that it takes sound and audio signals to go from one place to another and back and those of us who are old enough remember the satellite, the literal satellite delay that we used to have on the telephones when you had a voice call from England to America because because it went up to space and then back down to space and that takes time. And there used to be a couple of second delay in between each 
yeah, sentence. Because it has because, to relay from satellite right. to satellite. And, and now we can have these live calls. I mean, you're in Washington and I'm in Alberta, which is not too far away, but I can have a simultaneous, no delay conversation with my family in England, which is 10,000 miles away with no delay. And there's some science stuff that goes on to make that happen. I mean, it doesn't just act like overcoming those physical distance boundaries are remarkable. And we've done it. Uh, well, we have these it, seamless state calls, you know. And and again, going so going to post biological entities, right? One of the things that has occurred to me is it is a lot easier to send information or send patterns than it is to send a person. And right. so there's there's no reason that if you have probes around the galaxy, ET wouldn't just essentially transmit their consciousness or their mind, right, digitally to those probes and then ship it back when they're done with their task. Well, I think part of the, you know, it's more likely that, that I think it's more likely that once an intelligence, uh, an extraterrestrial intelligence has reached a certain level of, of curiosity uh, in its, in its home system. It's, it's going to move on because it's not tied to that system. It doesn't need, yeah. it doesn't need its star for its energy. It doesn't need, I don't know, food for, for um, energy. It doesn't need, you know, those kinds of bio or other things it can gain from wherever it, wherever it wants. It's just stuff perhaps the ability to to reconstitute stuff in some substantive way i'm not going to use the star trek sort of um replicator as an example here but the ability to use material raw material to make things that it needs in order to perpetuate its existence um those kind of tools can can be done anyway you just need you just need stuff and it seems to me that you know were i a curious etty uh and I know this is making the anthropocentric sort of fallacy, but were I extraterrestrial Etty with a, a long, potentially long existence, I would just move around various solar systems, exploring them uh, to understand more about the nature of, of the universe. And if that is the case, then you don't even need this kind of buoying of consciousness or or uh, replication of, you know, a holographic sort of presentation of yourself, which is probably more more likely a, a reasonable mechanism of of sort of extending your range they would just be there because they're already wandering around the universe why wouldn't you i mean yeah. if you're if you're not tied we do it all the time when we did again making the anthropocentric fallacy here but when we moved first from europe to to north america and it was a remarkable thing because we at the time weren't sure whether the world was round or not so they were sailing off never quite sure where they were going to end up and and uh th they did so because they wanted to explore they had this this urge to move about and discover and pillage and do all the other things but um there's there's reasonable justification that that apart from the pillaging part that the the moving about the scientific development is would still be a reasonable thing for a curiosity. Look, you don't get intelligence unless you're curious. So that becomes axiomatic. That desire to that desire to explore and to know more, that is one of the things by which you have become intelligent. And so it becomes axiomatic. And you can you can then claim, look, Etty are by nature curious, and curious things seek more knowledge. And you're going to run out of knowledge if you've been around a home system long enough to discover much of it. Let's go to UAP. If some UAP are extraterrestrial or non-human origin, uh, then they're already here. They're more advanced than us. And the Hobbesian trap may apply very well. So if mankind had a first strike opportunity for UAP, would we take it? Should we take it? I mean, that's essentially what we did with the Chinese balloons, right? Yeah, I, I th this is very interesting stuff, and and I'm going to preface by the uh, you and I have spoken recently um, about the the recent discussion to Congress um, of um, uh, those two uh, chaps uh, or three chaps. Were there three chaps? I can't remember how many there were now, but the the recent testimony that aliens have been alien biologics have been 
uh, obtained and uh, are in keeping of uh, you know America somewhere. Um, I'm hesitant to believe their claims, uh, but open-minded. Uh, what I think is needed is more demonstrable evidence rather than sort of circumstantial evidence. But uh, well, so yeah, I, I think I, if I could interject, I, I think yeah. that those claims, again, from a philosophical basis, I think that they present a really good case that we should have these axioms in place. And this should be something that we approach on a species level, right? I, I think if nothing else, this might be a shot across the bow saying, hey, you know, even though these individuals, um, you know, the, the veracity is is still under a lot of question, uh, we need to have this in place because sooner or later we'll need it. Yes, I think, you know, what's, what's very interesting is this, this uh, recent up, shift in UAP and uh, biologics discussion um, may, and I'm uh, not nailing my flag to the mast here, but um, may be sort of indicative of a, a general slow trickling down of, you know, the release of some truth from a government, let's say. If I were a strategic military organization with a well-kept secret that I felt the the world needed to be gently eased into the understanding of, this would be a perfect way to do it. I'm not claiming that that's the case, but if it were the case, this is this is exactly the way I'd do it. Snippets of information, a little bit from NASA, a little bit from some space piloty chaps, some thing to congress a little bit like i just trickle it out so there's no smack of knowledge to which the human species could react violently and aggressively it would just be like oh yeah i read that a couple of months ago oh wow they found it right okay that's interesting um because that's the way you would deal with that's the way i would deal with the problem um not i underline uh to claim that that is the case but this notion of UAPs being of, of sort of Ethi being uh, uh, long lived and, and here already, I don't know that I I don't know that I would agree that they, they're like on the planet already, but I certainly agree that they're very likely to be in the system and I think in the galaxy. And I I am very willing to accept the potential that rocks like Amuamua are actually. Uh, sort of eti probes or contain eti probes, which perhaps navigate solar systems to feed back information. The question of whether we should be taking first sort of preemptive strikes or not, th this is related to the argument that I'm going to make when we next speak about the sort of bodily integrity of, of biologics is that you you can't mess up that first interaction, you know? Yeah. If I if we met out, out of the blue, having never seen each other at a pub and I smack you in the face, this is not a good uh, relationship is going to make, you know, it's not, it's just not. Regardless of whether that was an effective strike or or not, um, it's not, it's not going to end well. And and it, I argue the, the same, he sort of prefaces the, ne the next conversation, I argue the same, you know, if we if Etty comes here asking for the the body of, a, of its fallen members back, and we say, "Well, we don't have any," and Etty know that we do, now we're untrustworthy. So that's not going to end well. Well, if we say, "Well, yes, but we've cut it up into bits and processed it, and it's here in a bag," yeah. that's not going to end well. But if we say, uh, "Yes, we've found them. We're very sorry that uh, they passed away. Here they are, in the way they were when they fell. We've kept them as." well preserved as we can please have your your people back uh this is I like that's a great way to start a a conversation um far better than either of the other two ways yeah and in so in terms of the the military aspect of this it reminds me of that saying you know uh when the only tool you have is a hammer every problem is a nail right except that in this case the only tool they have is a gun which means that every problem includes aggression or every solution includes aggression, right? And and that that does concern me because even with the UAP dialogue, um, you know, they're talking about air safety and things like that. 
Um, and again, it's it's not the fault of the military. That's what the military is designed for. The problem right. is they're not the right organization to handle those kinds of issues. No, and they are going to be, we've seen this in just about every science fiction film we've ever watched, they are going to be the most dominant voice around that special little table um, advising the whoever, you know, whichever organization's leader um, is going to be dealing with this sort of thing because they are the ones that are thinking necessarily in terms of defense and aggression and strategy and all these sorts of things. Um, and these are not the these are not well, the people that you need to be leading that discussion. In, in terms of real life stakes, fighting against ET in, in the movies, they've got ray guns, which are really for dramatic effect. But in real life, and again, this goes to your discussion of making you know a bad impression at first. I mean, they can just drop an asteroid on us, and it's game over for humanity, right? So we should probably avoid at all costs starting a war with them. There's there's a number of things that that I think uh, improperly guide the general consensus of opinion about, and it's led by individuals in society who are of the disposition that, you know, we can always overcome because we're, we're, uh, an interesting species who has the way of fighting his way out of bags and uh, and lots of stories about David and Goliath and William, uh, whatever it is, Will Smith punching the alien in the face on the Nevada desert or whatever it is. You know, these stories are, they are not based in reality. They're entertaining. But yeah. the capacities that we have for uh, major warfare, so weapons of mass destruction of the sorts of, um, of, of you know, nuclear missiles, they work on Earth, but, you know, they don't actually work in space. The reason they don't work in space is because they require an atmosphere. Most of the damage of a nuclear missile is done in the blast, but blasts require air to be moved, and if you don't have any air, they're functionally impotent. Um, the 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 radiation they release is is of a different order and a different kind than that naturally occurring in space anyway and far smaller so um and they aren't like the, the propulsion systems aren't geared for space travel so they become inaccurate yeah. if you fire them into space uh and i know that reagan had his his gig about laser things and all that kind of stuff in what, what what did he call it? The Star Wars program, whatever it was. I, I look at I, I know that there are there were some nascent attempts to create some sort of planetary defense system or at least an American defense system. Um, but really, factually, we have zero capacity to engage in any military conflict in space. If you launch a nuclear missile and it successfully detonates at something in space a space vessel only needs to back off a thousand miles and and that's not that that's literally nothing in space that is no space whatsoever in space then it moves off a thousand miles it's, it's all over there's no there's no result even if you struck the target and even if it detonated the shielding required for intra uh intraspace like in intergalactic travel intragalactic travel the shielding required for f for high speed space flight is massive a small piece of plastic can create a, a six inch um hole in a yeah. big sheet of aluminium the shielding required to 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 travel at the speeds that are i don't know quarter the speed of light or some fast speed are are massive m suggesting that an eti that is capable of traveling in space would have resolved a different tool a different system of you know you can't, you can't just put all that metal uh, on the front of a ship it becomes difficult to navigate and cumbersome and stuff uh, so there must be some other method so this all boils down to to answer your question there's what are you going to do you're throwing peas at a rock it's there is no point in even pretending to believe that a militaristic response to an eti 
that arrives in our solar system or is even on our way to our solar system is is futile. It's pointless. It's it the orders of magnitude of differentiation between the technological capacity of that ETI and our current ability to engage in any kind of military just non-existent. So well, it, given that's differential and given that military stuff is now off the table, regardless of what those little chaps around the table um, whispering in the ear of the president have to say, that, inf that response is non-viable. End of story. That means that only other options are communication, negotiation, discussion, you know, whatever. You can pile all kinds of things on, on that sort of side. But any kind of militaristic response is, is futile and uh, will not create the correct kind of relationship, I, I would argue. Not that the relationship would be like a human-to-human -human relationship. It'll be very different. But whatever it is, an aggressive one won't go down well. So resistance is futile. On really? that note, <laughs> on that note, Steve, let me thank you so much for your time today. It has Very been welcome. a pleasure and an honor. And again, we will return to this. We're, we're already scheduling a follow-up to talk about non-biological or biological and non-biological entities. So uh, yeah. again, let me thank you for your time. And let me close by asking, where do you see things going in the near future in terms of SETI, the UAP phenomena, and our social adjustment to the increasing likelihood of first contact. Because again, I think that's where we started with, it, in one way or another, it looks like we are edging towards some kind of a first contact event, maybe not in our lifetimes, but certainly uh, I, I would say more sooner than we might expect. I Let me tackle this last part just very quickly first. I, I think our interest to an ETI will require some sort of benchmark threshold. You know, I think we may very well have been visited in the past and they've observed the Dyson dinosaurs and said, oh, you know, that's interesting. There's life there. Let's come back in a couple hundred thousand years and see what goes on. Maybe, I don't know. Um, and so I think, you know, at this point now, we are, I would say, well on the way to becoming a species of interest to an other species of, that's that's technologically advanced because we are building awfully quickly um, our capacity for, for this sort of stuff. Um, so I would say that uh, not necessarily this year or, or next year and, and maybe not within 100 years, but I, I think that very, very likely if we are to be an attractive thing uh, to them now would be sort of a period that I would anticipate our you know sort of coming across their radar um not literally um in terms of where do i think this sort of needs to direct seti and meti well i'm mindful of that recent television series in in which uh it was a sort of a an alternative reality were russia to um have made it to the moon first i can't for all mankind i think it's a sort of a pseudo satire kind of thing um and i'm mindful of all that could have been achieved if instead of uh dropping the funding for the space uh race and the the space exploration they had and spending it on falling out with all of the other countries it falls out with uh it would have been far better to advance our space program and i think my advice not that i'm ever going to be asked to give it to the the government because the government doesn't care in people like me but uh were i to give my advice it would be uh, stop spending money on military and start spending money on space because space is the only tenable future for the human race the only one uh, because the the planet at some stage will either reach capacity um, or fail miserably for other reasons. And at some point that has to be geared properly for, and this is the endeavor that SETI and NASA need to be and are to a certain extent um, organized. You know, the, the finding another entity in 
our galaxy who has already overcome some of the issues we are likely to face will do nothing but increase our capacity for technological achievement and advancement of our people um, and a capacity to navigate the universe successfully, uh, long term and short term. And also the technological advancements that come in virtue of space exploration uh, benefit everybody else on the planet in the way that it gives us Velcro and other, other useless things. But uh, this is the endeavor. Now, finally, we need to stop thinking in terms of game theory uh, to double question our potential approach. And we need to recognize that what we need is a more substantive and dependable set of tools from which to build uh, a reasonable communication. Now, there are arguments that have been made philosophically, communication is difficult. That's one of the issues of my paper. And really, we should, instead of looking at those things, go, oh, yeah, a communication is going to be impossible because all these people say so. What we should actually be doing is looking at the potential mechanisms of communication and how we would recognize communication that's not the kinds of communication that we have, how we can identify different types of entities that are not humans, humanoid or humanistic, um, and focus on those to develop more philosophical and science research. You know, this is an area that needs more thinkers to be thinking in and fewer people to be sitting there going, you're mad, you're doing sci-fi and that's silly. Um, and I think that's where I'd like to leave it is that, you know, we, we need more of, not more of me, nobody needs more of me, but we need more people thinking in this and, and, and passing information to those underfunded organizations that are here to advance humanity. Steve, thank you again so much for your time today, sir. Thank you for having me on. It's been a pleasure to speak with you and thanks for uh, inviting me to the show again.